My name is Larry Pittman. I'm with thebibleteam.com, and welcome to the Read Along program. Today is October 19th, and for our reading schedule, for October 19th, we have, uh, yeah, there's a focus, Isaiah 66 and Jeremiah 1 through 2. So the whole purpose of this Read Along program is we're reading through the Old Testament this year, and every week I take a little time to read whatever that plan whatever the plan is for that day and uh, it's totally unrehearsed I don't really think about what I'm gonna say I, I basically just read it and discuss it sometimes it's um, chapters that I'm very familiar with sometimes it's almost as if I've never read it before because you know the, the Bible's huge and uh, you can't retain all of it um, you know, every year. So, anyway, um, I know a bit about um, Isaiah 66 and Jeremiah 1, maybe. Um, other than that, I'm, I'm kind of clueless. So, um, I, I, I really enjoy this. If you, if you haven't um, noticed, I'm, I'm really excited about uh, the Word of God. I, I, I just love to read it, and I, I love to share it with others. So that's what this is all about. If uh, just a little bit of my excitement can can inspire someone to read the Word of God and, 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 and make a, a more concerted effort to do that. Um, that that's what this is all about. And um, I, I'm not really a teacher, but I can. God's given me some um, skills and abilities, I think, to share things that He's taught me about the Word of God. So I'm passing it on. Um, maybe you can consider that a teacher. I, I don't know. But anyway. Um, it's, uh, we're going to end, um, you know, in Malachi at, at the end of the year. And, um, I'm not sure what, what's going on next year, but um, I'm talking way too long. So, we're going to get started. Isaiah 66, um, and before that, what's very crucial is we, we, we pray. So, we must not only worship God in truth, but also in spirit, John 4, 24. Um, so, we're going to do that right now. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we praise you, and we thank you for this time of, uh, of worship. It's a form of worship, Lord, where we, we spend these minutes um, reading your word and marveling over what, uh, over what we're going to read today. And, um, and God, we, we just ask you to open our hearts. Lord, we know that without your spirit, this book is pretty much meaningless to us. And there's so many mysterious things in this book anyway, Lord, that we really need your help to discern it. Lord, so we just ask for your presence right now, Lord, as I read and discuss what, what we're reading. We thank you, Lord, for a vast resource in your word that um, is perfect in every good way, that it might train us and teach us and rebuke us and, and all those good things, Lord. And we just praise you. And um, we give this time over to you, Lord. Uh, we worship you now. In, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Isaiah, chapter 66. This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Could you build me a temple as good as that? Could you build me such a resting place? My hands have made both heaven and earth. They and everything in them are mine. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will bless those who have humble and contrite hearts, who tremble at my word. But those who choose their own ways, delighting in their detestable sins, will not have their offerings accepted. When such people sacrifice a bull, it is no more acceptable than a human sacrifice. When they sacrifice a lamb, it's as though they had sacrificed a dog. When they bring an offering of grain, they might as well offer the blood of a pig. When they, turn, when they burn frankincense, it's as if they had blessed an idol. I will send them great trouble, all the things they feared. For when I called, they did not answer. When I spoke, they did not listen. They deliberately sinned before my very eyes and chose to do what they know I despise. Hear this message from the Lord, all you who tremble at his words. Your own people hate you and throw you out for being loyal to my name. 
Let the Lord be honored. They scoff. Be joyful in him, but they will be put to shame. What is all the commotion in the city? What is their terrible noise from the temple? It is the voice of the Lord taking vengeance against his enemies before the birth pains even begin. Jerusalem gives birth to a son who has who has ever seen anything as strange as this? Who has ever heard of such a thing? Has a nation ever been born in a single day? Has a country ever come forth in a mere moment? But the time Jerusalem's but by the time Jerusalem's birth pains begin, her children will be born. Would I ever bring this nation to the point of birth and then not deliver it? Asked the Lord. No, I would never keep this nation from being born, says the Lord, says, says your God. Rejoice with Jerusalem. Be glad with her, all you who love her and all you who mourn for her. Drink deeply of her glory, even as an infant drinks at its mother's comforting breasts. This is what the Lord says, I will give Jerusalem a river of peace and prosperity. The wealth of the nations will flow to her. Her children will be nursed at her breasts, carried in her arms, and held on her lap. I will comfort you there in Jerusalem, as a mother comforts her child. When you see these things, your heart will rejoice. You will flourish like the grass. Everyone will see the Lord's hand of blessing on his servants, and his anger against his enemies. See, the Lord is coming with fire, and his swift chariots roar like a whirlwind. He will bring punishment with the fury of his anger and the flaming fire of his hot rebuke. The Lord will punish the world by fire and by his sword. He will judge the earth, and many will be killed by him. Those who consecrate and purify themselves in a sacred garden with its idol in the center, feasting on pork and rats and other detestable meats, will come to a terrible end, says the Lord. I can see what they are doing, and I know what they are thinking. So I will gather all nations and peoples together, and they will see my glory. I will perform a sign among them, and I will send those who survive to be messengers to the nations to Tarshish, to the Libyans and Lydians, who are famous as ar archers, to Tubal and Greece, and to all the lands beyond the sea that have not heard of my fame or seen my glory. There they will declare my glory to the nations. They will bring the remnant of your people back from every nation. They will bring them to my holy mountain in Jerusalem as an offering to the Lord. They will ride on horses and chariots and wagons, and on mules and camels, says the Lord. And I will appoint some of them to be my priests and Levites. I, the Lord, have spoken. As surely as my new heavens and earth will remain, so will you always be my people, with a name that will never disappear, says the Lord. All humanity will come to worship me from week to week and from month to month. And as they go out, they will see the dead bodies of those who have rebelled against me. For the worms that devour them will never die, and the fire that burns them will never pass out. All who pass by will view them with utter horror. Jeremiah, chapter 1. These are the words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah. One of the priests from the town of Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. The Lord first gave messages to Jeremiah during the thirteenth year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. The Lord's messages, messages continued throughout the reign of King Jehoiakim, Jeho Josiah's son, until the eleventh year of the reign of King Zedekiah another of Josiah's sons. In August of that 11th year, the people of Jerusalem were taken away as captives. The Lord gave me this message. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart. 
and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. O oh, sovereign Lord, I said, I can't speak for you. I'm too young. The Lord replied, Don't say, I'm too young, for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of the people, for I will be with you and will protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Then the Lord reached out and touched my mouth and said, Look, I have put my words in your mouth. Today I appoint you to stand up against nations and kingdoms. Some you must uproot and tear down, destroy and overthrow. Others you must build up and plant. Then the Lord said to me, Look, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I replied, I see a branch from an almond tree. And the Lord said, That's right, and it means that I am watching, and I will certainly carry out all my plans. Then the Lord spoke to me again and asked, Why do you see me now? What do you see now? And I replied, I see a pot of boiling water spilling from the north. Yes, the Lord said, For terror from the north will boil out on the people of this land. Listen, I am calling the armies of the kingdoms of the north to come to Jerusalem. I, the Lord, have spoken. They will set their thrones at the gates of the city. They will attack its walls and all the other towns of Judah. I will pronounce judgment on my people for all their evil, for deserting me and burning incense to other gods. Yes, they worship idols made up with their own hands. Get up and prepare for action. Go out and tell them everything I have told you to say. Do not be afraid of them, or I will make you look foolish in front of them. For see, today I have made you strong, like a fortified city that cannot be captured, like an iron pil pillar or a bronze wall. You will stand against the whole land, the kings, officials, priests, and people of Judah. They will fight you, but they will fail. For I am with you, and I will take care of you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Jeremiah chapter 2 The Lord gave me another message. He said, Go and shout this message to Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. I remember how eager you were to please me, as a young bride long ago, how you loved me and followed me, even through the barren, barren wilderness. In those days Israel was holy to the Lord, the first of his children. All who harmed his people were declared guilty, and dis disaster fell on them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Listen to the word of the Lord, people of Jacob, all you families of Israel. This is what the Lord says. What did your ancestors find wrong with me that led them to stray so far from me? They worshipped worthless idols only to become worthless themselves. They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us safely out of Egypt and led us throughout, through, through the wilderness, a land of deserts and pits, a land of drought and death where no one lives or even travels. And when I brought you into a fruitful land to enjoy its bounty and goodness, you defiled my land and corrupted the possession I had promised you. The priests do not ask, Where is the Lord? Who Those who taught my word ignored me. The rulers turned against me, and the prophets soon spoke, uh, prophets spoke in the name of Baal, wasting their time on worthless idols. Therefore I will bring my case against you, says the Lord. I will even bring charges against your children's children in the years to come. Go west and look in the land of Cyprus. Go east and search through the land of Kedar. Has anyone ever heard of anything as strange as this? Has any nation ever traded its goods for new ones? Even though they are not gods at all. Um, Yet my people have exchanged the glorious God for worthless idols. I have I, the heavens are shocked at such a thing, and shrink back and shrink back in horror and dismay, says the Lord. For my people have done no two two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain 
of living water and they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. Why has Israel become a slave? Why has he been carried away as plunder? Strong lions have roared against him and the land has been destroyed. The towns are now in ruins and no one plants, no one lives in them anymore. Egyptians marching from their cities of Memphis and Tapans have destroyed Israel's glory and power. You and you have brought this upon yourselves by bringing, by rebelling against the Lord your God, even though he was leading you on the way. What have you gained by your alliances with Egypt and your covenants with Assyria? What good, are, what good to you are the streams of the Nile or the waters of the Euphrates River? Your wickedness will bring its own punishment for turning, for turning from me. Your turning from me will shame you. You will see what an evil, bitter thing it is to abandon the Lord your God and not to fear him. I, the Lord, the Lord of heaven's armies, have spoken. Long ago I broke the yoke that oppressed you and tore away the chains of your slavery. But you still said, I will not serve you. On every hill and under every green tree you have prostituted yourself by bowing down to idols. But that was but I was the one who planted you. Choose a vine. Choosing a vine and of the priest purest shock. The very best. How did you grow into this corrupt wild vine? No matter, no amount of soap or lye can make you clean. I still see the stain of your guilt. Is the sovereign Lord, have, I the sovereign Lord have spoken. You say that's not true. I haven't worshipped the images of Baal, but how can you say that? Look and go around, look in any valley in the land. Face the awful sins you have done. You are like a restless female camel desperately searching for a mate. You are like a wild donkey sniffing, um, sniffing the wind at mating time. Who can restrain her lust? Those who desire her don't need to search, for she goes running, for she goes running to them. When when will you stop running? When you when will you stop panning after other gods? But you say, save your breath. I'm in love with these foreign gods, and, and I can't stop loving them now. Israel is like a thief who feels shame only when he gets caught. They, their kings, officials, priests, and prophets, are all like alike in this. To An image carved from a place of wood, they say, You are my father. They, their kings, I'm, I'm picking up in uh, 26. I'm having <laughs> some technical difficulties with myself. Um, I'll restart at verse 26. Sorry for the delay. Israel is like a thief who feels shame only when he gets caught. They, their kings, officials, priests, and prophets are all like are, are all are alike in this. To an image carved from a piece of wood, they say, "You are my father." To an idol chiseled from a block of stone they say you are my mother they turn their backs on me but in times of trouble they cry out to me come and save us but why not call on these gods you have made when trouble comes let them save you if, if they can 
for you have as many gods as there are towns in Judah. Why do you accuse me of doing wrong? You are the ones who have rebelled, says the Lord. I have punished your children, but they did not respond to my discipline. You, you yourselves have killed your prophets as a lion kills its prey. Oh, my people, listen to my words of the Lord. Listen to the words of the Lord. Have I been like a desert to Israel? Have I been to them a land of darkness? Why then do my people say, at last we are free from God? We don't need him anymore. Does a young woman forget her jewelry? Does a bride hide her wedding dress? Yet for years on end, my people have forgotten me. You, How you plot and scheme to win your lovers. Even an experienced prostitute could learn from you. Your clothing is stained with the blood of the innocent and the poor. Though you didn't catch them breaking into your houses, and yet you say, I have done nothing wrong. Surely God isn't, ang isn't angry with me, but how I will punish you severely because you claim you have not sinned. First here, then there, you flit from one alley, ally to another asking for help. But your new friends in Egypt will let you down, just as Syria, Assyria did before. In despair, you will be led into exile with your hands on your heads. For the Lord has rejected the nations you trust. They will not help you at all. Amen. That concludes it. And that took us, um, it's a little under 22 minutes now. It was uh, a bit longer than usual. Usually uh, the readings don't go this long. And uh, with my little technical difficulties, uh, thank you for your patience. Okay, so let's go back to Isaiah 66. Now, Isaiah, um, it tells you at the beginning of Isaiah um, when he served. Uh, study Bibles will give you notes on that kind of information. I have a Bible that has no notes. It has footnotes for the text itself, but it doesn't have any commentary, um, no study things at all. It's just plain uh, text of the Bible. That's the way I like it. Um, Isaiah chapter 1. These are the visions that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. He saw these visions during the years when Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah were kings of Judah. Um, it's my understanding that Isaiah served from Uzziah through um, Manasseh. Hezekiah was one of the last good kings. Hezekiah was a, actually a, a great king. He did what was right. And he wasn't perfect, but for the most part, he had a great reign. He did what was right. And then Hezekiah um, was succeeded by, um, by um, Manasseh. And Manasseh was one of the um, one of the worst kings. He was actually it was King Manasseh that was blamed for uh, the exile, um, the Babylonian exile. It's it's I've I've heard it, I've read it, and this is why I don't care for commentaries because it's I, I don't know how reliable it is, but I've I've heard that um, Isaiah was sawed in half by um, by King Manasseh because he was just wicked before he repented which was you know later on in his life and you can read about that in I think one of the Chronicles books but anyway Isaiah ruled um, or, or was a prophet from from that time period that's a it's about um, roughly 700 years BC so seven years before Christ that's in in it's probably quite a bit of years and I don't have a timeline to know that for exact, but it's right around that ballpark. Seven, you know, seven to six hundred years. And um, so this just give, gives you an idea of, of when Isaiah was, uh, was writing this. And um, 
I love how it begins in verse 2. I will bless those who have humble and contrite hearts who tremble at my word. But those who cho choose their own ways, delighting in their detestable sins, will not have their offerings accepted. When such people sacrifice a bull, it is no more acceptable than a human sacrifice. When they sacrifice a lamb, it's as though they had sacrificed a dog. Um, when they bring an offering of grain, they might as well offer the blood of a pig. So let's talk about this a little bit. Um, this this one verse here in two, verse two, at the end of it. Um, I will bless those who have humble and contrite hearts, who tremble at my word. And this is very key. Um, you know, so much of the Bible um, talks about two different groups of people. Those that seek the Lord, those that have a heart for God, those that are humble. And then the other group of people are those that despise God, that want nothing to do with God, that forget God. Um, we've all been on one side of that equation. We've all at one time forgot God. We've all at one time ran away from God. We've all at one time uh, despised God. So there's those that um, live for themselves, basically, and those that live for God. Um, the difference in, in another way to look at that is the difference between the humble and the proud. Because you cannot come to God when you're proud. There's no way you can come to God when you, when you have a pride issue. When you don't think you need anyone's help. When you think you got everything covered. Um, so only when you're humble, and God can humble us in so many ways, where we come to the end of ourselves, when we come to a place in our lives that, that um, we realize you know, we don't have anything figured out, that we've made a mess of our lives, and that's when we repent and turn to God. So, um, I, I just think it's a beautiful verse. I will bless those who have humble and contrite hearts, who tremble at my word. Um, and, and that's what I love about Scripture. I, I want to honor the word. And, um, and have a great reverence for it. So, and then it talks about those that are, are not contrite, those that ha are proud. Um, and what I love about reading verses, uh, verse 3 here pretty much is about offerings. God wants obedience far more than he wants offerings. God wants love far more than he wants works. So what he's saying is for those that aren't contrite, for those that aren't sorry, they're not repentant, um, anything you sacrifice is meaningless. You know how many people, those that don't know God, um, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, especially the rich. Now, I know there can be rich people that um, love God, but let's talk about the rich that don't love God. So many times, if you talk to someone that's wealthy, they, they tend to brag about all that they've done, and not only that, all that they've given. They, they brag about all they've done in the community. Hey, we built this library, and it's even got their name on it. And they, you know, they've given to the poor. They've, they've, you know, created a homeless shelter. You know what? In God's eyes, it's, it's meaningless. If it's not done unto the Lord, if it's not done um, as for a heart for God, out of obedience to Him, it, it doesn't mean a, a darn thing. And there's a lesson to be learned. And um, I think it's. Um, I think it's 1 Samuel 15 when um, King Saul is told to kill all the uh, all the people of the, of the of the Amalekites, and um, he fails to do that, and he are, he reasons in his mind. He was told not only killed all the people, but all the all the um, the livestock. So. He, well, he fails to kill the king, King Agag of the Amalekites, and he also fails to can't kill all the, all the livestock. And he reasons in his mind that he's going to use those as, as an offering to, to God, thinking that, you know, he, as if he knows better. 
he was given explicit instructions. He was told what the Lord desired because Samuel gave him all he needed to know. And it was it was pretty complete. And and Saul, um, he 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 acts as if he knows better. He 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 he, he saves King Agag and and he saves the livestock in the understanding, you know, his his ration rationalization or justification, whatever you want to call it, is um is 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 based on giving this livestock in an offering. So um, that's where Samuel explains to him that the Lord desires obedience over sacrifice. So you can know that um, when someone's bragging about how much they're given, you know, in your heart you, you can know that it doesn't mean anything. It's worthless. Um, now I think some people love God and, and give because they love God. Um, and um, I, I'm, I'm not saying, it, I'd never tell someone it was wrong for them to, to give. I wouldn't go that far. Um, all I know is if, if you don't do, if, if, if what you do isn't unto the Lord, it, 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 it just has very little meaning is all I'm trying to say. Of course, if they help someone out, that's awesome. And I don't want to downplay it at all. I, I don't want to say that it's, it's a waste of time. I'm saying in the eyes of the Lord. And, and God can use rich people to, to bless other people. So, um, in other words, yeah, the, the guy did something that, that God set up, you know, that set, set of circumstances. But that doesn't mean the, the guy's going to be blessed for it, you know, whoever did give. Um, because, you know, God can work through anybody. So I, I, I kind of want to be clear. I don't want to be legalistic about this and say, hey, you know, it's just not right for you to give, you know, because I mean, that's, you know, an unbeliever is going to do what unbelievers do. Um, you know, I, I think they, they, they need to come to Christ and, and, and walk in his ways is, is what's important, not, not giving. Um, so anyway, you know, it, in other words, there is no accounting system that God has where someone gives more than another person. I mean, that's that's where you get into boasting, and that's not how it works either. So I don't want to. I want to move on. Um, verse four: I will send them great trouble. All the things they feared. For when I called, they did not answer. When I spoke, they did not listen. They, they deliberately sinned before my very eyes. And chose to do what they know, what they know I despise. And what I like about this is, um, it it, it clearly explains uh, what God is ticked off about the most. He he treats us like his children, and when we're obedient, that's you know when when we love him, we we become obedient to him. We want to do what pleases him, but when we don't even acknowledge him and you know run our own way, we ignore God. And no, you know, and fail to listen to him. Um, you know, that's that's what he hates. It's it's either whether you have a relationship with Jesus or you don't. And he, that's what he desires most is for us to have a relationship with him. Okay, so let's move on. Um, he gets into um, the future here. There's a prophecy here. And it starts in verse 5. Hear this message from the Lord, all you who tremble at his words. Your own people hate you and throw you out for being loyal to my name. Let the Lord be honored. They scoff. Be joyful in him, but they will be put to shame. Um... Um, in verse 7, before the birth pains even begin, Jerusalem gives birth to a son who is who has ever seen anything as strange as this? Who ever heard of such a thing? Has a nation ever been born in a single day? Has a country ever come forth in a mere moment? But by the time Jerusalem's birth pains begin, her child will be born. You know, frankly, I have no idea what this is talking about. I, I don't know. 
And if someone does, please, please let me know because I'm not clear. And, and I could probably look it up in a study Bible and maybe get some insight. Um, that's when I resort to a study Bible when, I, when I'm totally clueless and, and have a great interest in it. Um, and this I might want to look up. But it seems to me um, there's, a sign, there's a message of hope here. Um, in verse 12, this is what the Lord says, I will give Jerusalem a river of peace and prosperity. The wealth of the nations will flow to her. Her children will be nursed at her breast, carried in her arms, and held on her lap. I will comfort you there in Jerusalem as a mother comforts her child. Um, that, I think, is signs of, you know, for something to come, something we haven't seen today. Um, verse 14, when you see these things, your heart will rejoice. You will flourish like the grass. Everyone will see the Lord's hand of blessing on his servants. Um, yeah, I think this is yet to come, my friends. This is specifically talking about Jerusalem, Judah, and perhaps the Benjamin tribe. See, the Lord is coming with fire. So let me conclude this little section here, and then we'll talk. The See, the Lord is coming with fire, and his swift chariots roar like a whirlwind. He will bring punishment with the fury of his anger, and the flaming fire of his hot rebuke. The Lord will punish the world by fire, and by his sword. He will judge the earth, and many will be killed by, by him. To me, this, this parallels um, much of what we read about in Revelation. It's ap apocalyptic uh, in nature, um, and it's talking about great things are to come you know, beyond uh, the Lord's judgment. Because the Lord's coming, and he's going to um, execute judgment. And um, it says everyone will see the Lord's hand of blessing on his servants. So that is down the line because, you know, it's clearly something that hasn't happened yet. Uh, okay, so then 17, those who consecrate and purify themselves in a sacred gar garden with its idol in the center feasting on pork and rats and other detestable meats will come to a terrible end. Um... So there's, there's a great warning. <laughs> um, I mean, it's okay that we don't have it all figured out. We don't have to all, because there's just so much in this book and, and in the Old Testament in general that um, are far beyond my, my wisdom and knowledge. Um, and that's okay. Because every time I read it, I get, I get a little bit more. And it gets more familiar and I get more enjoyment each time I read. When I first read Isaiah, I was almost totally clueless. There was just a few things I picked up on that you know I could really relate to, and it made sense to me. But other than that, it was you know just kind of murky. The book of Isaiah, um, a little gem here and there would appear, but other than that, um, a lot of it didn't make sense. So all I'm trying to say is. Um, I'm trying to make sense of it, and, and frankly, I, I'm not getting very far with this chapter. I, I, I've, I mean, I've talked about it so far, but this latter part, um, I, have, I have a hard time with. Um, it, to me, it's more prophecy of what's going to happen. I mean, that's in, in my nutshell. They will ride on chariots in verse 20. Uh, they will ride on horses in chariots and wagons on a mules and camel, says the Lord, and, be, and I will appoint some of them to be my priests. And leave its eyes the Lord has spoken. Um, and then clearly 22 through 24 is beyond um, this earth. Because there's so much that's mentioned all throughout the Bible about the current heavens and earth will, will, will pass away. It will just be gone. The only thing left will be our souls and, um, and the word of God. Um, everything else will fade away. Um, so verse 22 says, as surely as my new heavens and earth will remain, so will you always be my people. And with with the name that will never disappear, says the Lord. So there's a great hope. All who are God's people will remain, along with the new heavens and the earth. Um, and then verse 23 and 24, all humanity will come to worship me from week to week and from month to month as they go out. They will see dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. And that's that's just flat out 
uh, gruesome to me. That's all I can think about. I can't imagine uh, what that's going to look like. Um, you know, the last uh, sentence says, all who pass by will view them with utter horror. And <laughs> I, there's some crazy things in this book, and that's all I'll say. Um, it's just, it's fascinating to me, at the very least. Um, so let's turn to Jeremiah. I don't want to take a whole lot more time. Um, apparently, Jeremiah was very young when um, he was called. Um, in verse 6 of Sovereign Lord, I said, I can't speak for you. I'm too young. The Lord replied, don't say I'm too young, for you must go wherever I send you and wherever and say wherever I tell you. Um, so apparently, Jeremiah, um, as a man of God, he was a man of God quite early, apparently, and um, he probably had this idea that eventually, someday, he's going to grow old and start speaking for God. And um, we know that he was around. He was, he was a, apparently he was a Benjamite in verse one, and the the Lord first gave messages to Jeremiah during the thirteenth year of the reign of Josiah. So um, if Isaiah uh, was a prophet in Manasseh's day, and Manasseh ruled for fifty five years, it's quite a long time. And um, and then came Manasseh, then Ammon, and then Josiah. So I'm not exactly sure when Isaiah stopped being a prophet, but I'm willing to venture that Jeremiah um, probably started being a prophet maybe, I don't know, several, many decades, if not maybe a hundred years after Isaiah stopped. Um, so, oh, back to Jeremiah. Apparently he thought he was too young that, um, you know, maybe when I get old, I'll be a prophet. But, uh, but, sorry, I'm so sorry, I don't mean to uh, yawn, I, I need to get more sleep. Um, so, you know, God says, you're, you know, don't say I'm too young. You know, God will, um, you know, don't be afraid of the people, for I will be with you and protect you. You know, when I read this, for I will be with you, I can't um, get out of my head, you know, echoes, um, in Matthew 28, um, Jesus' last words, and I will always be with you till the end of the age, and I will always be with you. So I love when we see passages in the Old Testament that um, echo what we what we know in the New Testament, and, and vice versa. We read something in the Old Testament, and then we read something about it in the New Testament. So um, there's you know there's a common thread there. Same God that's telling Jeremiah, "I will always be with you," is the same God. That's telling the disciples, I will be always be with you. Um, it's pretty neat. In verse 9, then the Lord reached out and touched my mouth and said, Look, I put my words in your mouth. Today I, I appoint you to stand up against nations and kingdoms. So he wants Jeremiah to be a spokesperson for him. And um, that's pretty exciting. <laughs> um, imagine that. And, um, you know, I believe that pastors and men and women of God today, um, you know, should consider themselves spokespersons for God. If they're publicly speaking, addressing people, I believe that God has put his words in their mouth. I don't think uh, Jeremiah being the prophet, other than writing this book, um, I don't think anyone speaking today publicly um, as, a, as a minister of Jesus, um, servant of Jesus Christ, I don't think th there's any difference. I think um, the Spirit should give us the words. Just like God said, I put my mouth words in your mouth, I don't think it should be any different. And um, I don't think it should be taken any less, or any any less, um, any, you know, uh, I think, I don't think there should be any less weight to that understanding. When 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 I speak, I I ask for God to give me the words to say, and, and I think that's how He works. Um, and I think it's very important to be conscious of that. I don't want to say something foolish. I don't want to say something that's misleading. I take this very seriously. So um, I think that's one thing we can learn from this, this chapter. Okay, so let's let's wrap this up. Chapter 1 is pretty short. Um,
this is a, a prophecy for um, the coming um, exile for the uh, Babylonians coming. Um, verse verse 14, yes, the Lord said, for terror from the north will boil out on the people of this land. Listen, I am calling the armies of the kingdoms of the north to come to Jerusalem. I, the Lord, have spoken. Um, they will set their thrones at the gates of the city. They will attack its walls and all their towns um, of Judah. I will pronounce judgment on my people for other evil. Um, verse 17 get up and prepare for action go out and tell them everything I, I tell you to say do not be afraid of them or I will make you look foolish in front of them um, so what happens here and through much of I, uh, Jeremiah and I love this book by the way I, I actually like Jeremiah I think better than Isaiah there's a lot of good stuff in Isaiah but um, to me I, I think Jeremiah gives you a little better understanding of who the person is and, and, and he's a little more transparent because the stuff you read in Jeremiah helps us um, I, I, I have a, a greater connection with Jeremiah than I do with um, Isaiah um, and and so God's asking Jeremiah to do um, something that is I, I don't know if I'd want the Lord to ask me to do what he's asked Jeremiah. Um, he's actually pitting Jeremiah against everybody. Um, Jeremiah does not have a popular message. He's he's telling the people of Jerusalem and all of Judah that they're going to be um, ransacked, that they're going to be having a siege put against Jerusalem, and that, that they're going to be um, exiled. I mean, I recommend you read Jeremiah with me start today read these first two chapters maybe and get started because this is a this is a great book there's a lot of prophecy in it that you know you just kinda read through and and get on with it but um, you know prophecy is just just in a way hard to read because we don't really know how to relate to it but other than that there's a, a lot of good stuff in here um, where Jeremiah had to put up with a lot of crap from from the rulers of his day and um, and he wasn't treated with respect, um, but he, he was a man on a mission. And so, constantly through the book, we read about God telling him, "Don't be afraid." God telling Jeremiah, "You know, um, I will I will make you strong. I will give you strength." And you know, what I love about that is. Jeremiah was just a man. He was just another man doing God's work and he needed to be told. He needed to be, you know, those those uh, um, concepts needed to be reinforced. I will always be with you. And there's no different difference between Jeremiah and for us. If we're to persevere, if we're to continue being patient, if we're to continue walking in, in the Lord's ways, um, we need all the encouragement, we need all the strength, um, that we can get and it's it's not always easy so um, I'm telling you um, especially if you're going through some hard times read the book of Jeremiah with me and just email me if you want the plan it's usually um, two chapters one day and three chapters the next day so today we read um, three chapters um, so tomorrow we'll be reading uh, Jeremiah 3 through 4 and you can just read through me with like that and um, every week I'll, I'll report with a, another video. Um, I'm not going to um, comment on chapter 2. We're way over time that I wanted to spend going on um, 15 minutes. My goodness. Um, but that's how ver uh, chapter 4 ends. For I am with you and, and I will take care of you. So let's... Oh, there's one more comment I have to make on chapter 2. So I just kind of... Um, if you look at chapter 2, verse 13, For my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water. Now what's awesome about that is if you reflect on Jesus is at the at the well um, in John chapter 4, when he approaches the uh, you know the adulterous woman, um, he he tells her that I'll give you living water, water that you'll never um, thirst. And so here, here they've abandoned me, the fountain of living water. Is that not awesome or what? You know, Jesus, Jesus is the word. And this is, 
This is him talking there. Um, they have abandoned me, the fountain of living water. So I just think that's awesome. So I didn't want to um, leave this today without mentioning that. And um, there's, there's a lot I can comment, but I don't have all day. <laughs> I wish I could talk more. Um, I want to leave you with this. At the end of chapter 1, um, verse 19, they will fight you, but they will fail. You know, that's what you need to be told. That's what we all need to hear that from God. They will fight you, but they will fail. And it's the enemy fighting us. It's it's not, our enemy is not flesh and blood, but it's, you know, the forces of darkness. And um, the devil, Satan, whoever you want to call it, his minions will fight us, um, but they will fail. That applies for us, friends. Those are words we can take into our heart and know that um, if we're a servant of Christ, he, he's given us this promise as well. For I am with you, and I will take care of you. I, the Lord, have spoken. So that's something we can read and understand that, that God wants us to know that for us. And I thank you for your patience of putting up with me and, um, um, and for, for listening, especially for this length of time. Um, dear, dear Father, we praise you. We thank you for your wonderful word. We thank you for this, this, this time. And we just ask you to, to bless us that this week and help us uh, uh, retain uh, what we've read today, at least a little bit, that you always be with us. If we understand that, that's enough, Lord. So I praise you, and um, I thank you so much, dear Jesus. Um, in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you, friends. Have a great day. Bye-bye.